Hey everyone, Josh Powers here with Quixel, and welcome back to this tutorial series on the Mixer Mask Stack. Today we're going to be going over the Position Gradient Mask Component, so let's get right to it. The Position Gradient Mask Component is a very straightforward component. When applied, Position Gradient will use displacement and normal directions to create a mask that starts at white and gradually fades to black. At first glance, this component might seem fairly limited, but there are several creative ways we can put position gradient to use, and we'll go over some of those in a moment. Before we do that, however, let's take a look at the settings within the component. To start off, we have angle and tilt. Tilt will determine the tilt in the vertical direction of the normals to include in the mask. For example, a zero degree tilt will have the mask coming from the top. Whereas if we slide this tilt handle all the way to the 90 degree mark, the direction of the mask is now coming from the side. With the mask now projecting from the side, we can then rotate the angle handle to change the angle the mask will be coming from. And if you have a specific value in mind, you can also enter those values numerically into the slots off to the right of the handles. If you hold down shift when moving the angle or tilt handles, your movement will snap to 15 degree increments, which gives you more precise adjustments of the settings. Just below angle and tilt are two radio buttons, above and below. When the tilt is set to zero degrees, the mask will project from the top down by default. By switching this radio button to be from below, it will, as you probably guessed, project from the bottom up. Similar to the curvature component we covered before, we have a few ways to determine how the mask information is calculated. The default setting is mesh and underlying mix. As with curvature, this will not only use the mesh and its associated displacement and normal information to determine the gradient, but also any of the active layers beneath. As I toggle this layer on and off, you can see some of the subtle changes in the mask that are picked up because of this setting. Next is mesh and base displacement. This will exclusively use the mesh and the associated textures, but ignore all the other layers beneath, which is why the details from the layer I was toggling a moment ago are no longer visible even though the layer is still active. Lastly, there's mesh only. This setting will just use the geometry of the mesh to gather the position gradient and will practically look like a perfect gradient mask. The difference between the last two settings is quite subtle, but there might be instances where you want to have some of that control, so they're there for you if you need them. Lastly, we have a pair of sliders for the mask range, which controls the range of the gradient's grayscale value. If we drag the left slider over, the black value will consume more of the mask. And likewise, if we pull the right slider over, the white value will increase. If we bring the two close together, we'll see one half mostly bright, one half mostly dark, and then the closer the two sliders are together, the less of the gradient we see bridging the white and black, to the point that we can get rid of the transition altogether and make a sharp line. Also, if you hold down shift, you can drag both sliders at the same time, as long as both sliders will move within the zero to one range. This is handy if you have a range setting you're happy with, but want to adjust where the transition occurs on the model. And then lastly, we have invert, which does exactly as it sounds and inverts the results of your mask. Okay, now that we've gone over how the component works, let's take a look at a couple of examples of how we can use it for our day-to-day -day texturing process. Let's say I want to add a simple paint stripe to this canister here. If I activate the solid layer and give it a mask, I can toss on a position gradient to get us started. The first thing I'll do is go into mask mode, and then I'll want to bring the range sliders together to give us a sharp transition. Again, if I hold down shift, I can adjust both sliders simultaneously to where I want the bottom of the stripe to be. Now I could go back to the component button and add another position gradient, but I can also right click on the current layer and click copy component. If I right click again, I can select paste as new, and this will create a new component with the exact same settings as the one I copied. Now that I have a second component, the first thing I'll do is change it so that it's coming from below, and then I'll switch the blend setting of the layer to multiply. This will multiply the layer's mask onto the layer beneath, and since I have only black or white values, the white values of this layer will be ignored and only the black pixels will be included. So now all I have to do is adjust the range on this layer to the desired thickness of the stripe, and now we have a perfect paint stripe going around the canister. I can then add some more layers on top of this, such as a subtle Gaussian blur and an imperfection through a map component to add some scratches and chipping to the paint. And if you're not sure what the map component is, don't worry, we'll be covering that in a separate video very soon. 
Another way we can use the position gradient is to create some mud and grime splashing off the ground onto the bottom of a mesh. So let's activate the mud surface here and then give it a mask stack. We'll go into the mask mode and then start with a position gradient, setting the direction to come from below. After that, we'll just pull up the dark color range slider to about halfway, and then we're done with this layer. Next, I added a map component with a stone surface from the Megascans library. Again, I'll go over this component more comprehensively very soon, so for now we'll keep the talk of this layer at a high level. I simply adjust the range of the map component to give me some pretty sharp contrasting results, and then I set the blend mode to add so that only the bright values of the mask transfer to the layers below. Alright, let's add another position gradient on top of this, and then all we need to do is invert the results and set the blend mode to multiply, which will mask out the pattern detail from the map component as it gets higher on the mesh. Then to give us some more control on the tightness of that falloff, we'll add a gradient remap modifier and adjust the settings to give us a nice falloff closer to the bottom. And lastly, for a subtle touch, we'll throw on a curvature component and set it to cavities only and tighten the levels quite a bit. We'll set the blend mode to add and then the opacity down a little bit. And if we go back to render mode, you can see that we have a bit of a wet looking mud on the bottom of the mesh as if rain had kicked up dirt and debris over the years. And we also have traces of mud and grime that has built up in the crevices all over, which adds a lot of depth and character to this texture. As you can see, position gradient can not only be used by itself, but also used in conjunction with other components and modifiers to give you some fantastic looking masks. I hope this video gave you a glimpse into how a seemingly simple mask component can be utilized in powerful ways to help you create stunning textures quickly and efficiently. Stay tuned for the next video coming tomorrow. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.